Our guest today is chairman of the Board of Trustees for the University of Illinois. The University of Illinois has a budget just under $5 billion and 70,000 students. At the time of his appointment, the university was reeling from a high-profile admissions scandal. Happily, enormous change has taken place. Our guest today is a Chicagoan. He and his family have been among the greatest supporters of the city of Chicago. With the help of Chicagoans, our guest today's family led the charge in beating back prejudice and put a Catholic in the White House. There we go. Thank you. He and his family have helped the world better understand our brothers and sisters with special needs through their leadership at the Special Olympics. Our guest today reminded, as Skinny alluded to, the business and, and civic leaders at a recent breakfast that Chicago's greatest export to the world has been, and may always be, the Special Olympics. The best thing he ever did was marry his wife, Sheila. Yeah. In addition to being an outstanding wife and mother, she uh, is a lawyer who works at the Legal Assistance Foundation, originally started by another uh, Chicagoan, part of the War on Poverty, Sergeant Shriver. And she's carrying on a family tradition, and we're also honored to have with, her today, with us today her mother and father, Bob and Sheila Berner. Thank you very much for being with us. Our guest today and his wife have four beautiful children, Kate, Chris, Sarah, and Claire. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the City Club of Chicago, Chris Kennedy. Chris? Well, thank you all. It's good to be back with everyone today. For decades, the City Club has been the spearhead of change for our city. New ideas, great concepts, and fresh starts are introduced to Chicago for the first time here at the City Club. The club continues to be the forum where the leadership of Chicago's political, economic, and intellectual communities, the, the last group is a nod to the great Paul Green, come together to wrestle with the issues of the day. Like the meal itself, this is a communal enterprise. In part, we recognize that we who are in Chicago are all tied together, one another like an oversized American family. In my mind, there is nothing better to strive for than that, to be a part of a larger family, to be a part of something bigger than ourselves, and ultimately to serve the larger community with the unique gifts that each of us has been given. I know that most of the speakers focus intently on Chicago, and today I want to speak about the state of Illinois and its flagship university. I don't think you need to have gone to the University of Illinois to care about its future, just as I don't think you need to live in Illinois to care about our state. Whether you live in Chicago or not, if you love this country, you must care about our city and about our state. History teaches us that what happens to Illinois will happen to the rest of the country. If we get stronger, the country will get stronger. If we get weaker, so goes the nation. The state is weaker now than it has ever been before. With rising taxes, including a nearly 4% annual growth rate, declining taxable assets, and a gaping hole in the budget, including the highest per capita budget deficit of any state in the country. In 2000, Illinois ranked 28th in terms of state and local tax burden, as shown at the bottom left of this chart. On the right side, in 2011, we project we'll have the fourth highest per capita tax burden in the nation. This, cho this chart shows the five post-war recessions and the months it took for white-collar jobs to return to the pre-recession levels. The thick red line, which stretches deep and long, is the 2007-2009 recession, the source of most of the problems in our state. Our job growth is not bouncing back as it has in prior recessions. Already 30 months into this one, 
Job levels have barely started to climb back up to pre-recession numbers. Many of those jobs have been replaced, but just not in Illinois. Those jobs, for the most part, have been consolidated elsewhere. This chart shows the jobs moving from the light-colored states to the dark-colored states. Consolidation has probably been the single most important economic trend in the last two decades. In fact, there are entire publications now dedicated solely to covering the news of companies buying other companies. The largest grocery store in the United States today is now Walmart. Half of the entire United States fast food industry is controlled by just six companies. Google owns 70% of the online search market. 50% of all men's suits are now sold through a single retailer, Men's Warehouse. Consolidation is affecting retail, and it is affecting manufacturing, and it is affecting large-scale corporate mergers and acquisitions as well. In fact, many of the enormous corporations which used to dominate the Chicago business scene have now been bought by much larger institutions headquartered in places like London, New York, and Charlotte. Just as consolidation has impacted individual industries, it has been impacting entire cities as well. What is disturbing for Chicago is the fact that the amount of economic activity controlled by individual cities has been consolidating into mega cities. Enormous mega cities have developed and Chicago is not keeping pace with their growth. 50 years ago, Chicago was one of the 10 largest cities in the world. Today, we're struggling to stay in the top 30. Before the start of this last recession, we were ranked 115th on the list of the fastest growing large metropolitan economies in the world. As we exit the recession, we're now 127th on the list. Of the 50 wealthiest communities in the United States, Illinois is no longer home to a single one. If a company is going to allocate assets to a particular geographic market, we need to be cognizant that those companies may allocate their assets somewhere else, someplace with more people, greater economic activity, and higher population growth rates. We need to keep pace with competitive cities or eventually we will lose out in the race for consolidating corporations and new business development and the important white collar jobs which follow them. Increased economic development is critical to our competitive situation with other cities, states, and regions. Just as importantly, economic activity is necessary to increase our tax base, which is critical to fund government and thereby provide basic social services like our police force and fire protection. Economic development is also critical to providing long-term dependable funding for a robust arts environment. A growing tax base is necessary to fund great kindergarten through 12th grade education and the funding of almost every social service from health care to housing to hunger. In short, economic development is crucial to the long-term sustainability of our region. More companies have moved to Illinois to open businesses at the Merchandise Mart Center than any other location in the state. I know what it takes to get companies to move here. I know what a challenge it can be. And I know how much easier it is to grow a company here than it is to import one. I think there is a special role that public research universities play in the economy of our state and therefore in the communities which that economy is meant to serve. That special role is the creation of new knowledge, which leads to the development of new products, which ultimately leads to new jobs. Perhaps the only perpetual job creation activity that a government can engage in is funding academic research institutions and in higher education like the University of Illinois. I know more about the U of I than I do about other major research universities like Northwestern or the University of Chicago. Like Northwestern and U of C, the University of Illinois is not simply another college or another form of higher education. It is different because it is an academic research institution. Each year at the University of Illinois, we earn about $800 million from federal government and other institutions in research funding. Northwestern receives about $485 million, and the University of Chicago got about 395. The U of I Chicago campus, UIC, attracted $250 million, which is more than all of the research conducted at all of the other public universities in Illinois combined. Nothing is more important to the future of Illinois our citizens and communities, the health of the economy of the state, our quality of life and the competitive positioning of our region on the national and global stage, 
than are these academic research institutions. Like the other research powerhouses, the University of Illinois has the potential to be a perpetual job creation machine. I know how this dynamic works. I have seen it up close. Before I moved to Chicago, I lived in Boston and I saw firsthand how research universities can drive the rebirth of an economy. Boston as an economic center has died multiple times and yet again and again it has risen from those ashes as a formidable economic center by unleashing the transformative power of great research institutions. Over and over again Boston died and was reborn. First as a shipping capital, then as a banking capital, then Route 128 emerged as the center of the country's high-tech boom with companies like Wang Computers and DEC. Then that sector died in Boston, and now the city is re-emerging as a leader in biotechnology and nanotechnology, and the economy there remains strong. The constant economic rebirth was driven by the research institutions in the region, which have led the way out of every economic recovery. This was achievable in part because the leadership of those great research institutions stayed close to the political and business leadership. Those political leaders brought home federal government research grants, which funded basic research, which supported applied research, which created new ideas around which were built new companies that employed new people who paid taxes, which funded local schools, and created a whole new supply of highly educated students capable of propelling the cycle again and again. The university research operations in the Boston region created new jobs over and over again. I went to college in Boston and graduated from Boston, in 19, Boston College in 1986. Everyone in Boston at that time knew of Father Monin who ran BC and like the rest of the leaders there had an incredibly high profile. They also knew Derek Bach who was the president of Harvard at the time. The man who was president of Boston University, John Silber, ran for governor of Massachusetts and he came close to winning. The president of the Massachusetts State Senate, Bill Bulger, left that job to become head of the University of Massachusetts. There was great interplay between the university presidents, the political officials, and the business leadership. The university presidents encouraged business leaderships, leaders to support elected officials like John Kerry and Ted Kennedy and Tip O'Neill and to become fully engaged in the political process. John Kerry and Teddy and Tip went to Washington to bring home federal government research grants for places like Harvard and BC and MIT and Brandeis and other research institutions. Those schools invested in basic research and that research sloughed off applied research and the trustees and other business leaders invested in those ideas which created small companies that employed people who paid taxes which funded better schools and that virtuous cycle continued again and again. MIT alumni alone have started 25,000 new companies. Improving funding for academic research institution is dependent on a close working relationship between political, business, and academic leaderships in the great research institutions themselves. That dynamic has not always existed in a great way in Illinois. Most business leaders in Chicago could not name all the presidents of Northwestern or the University of Chicago or DePaul, the largest Catholic university in the United States, or Loyola, or the Illinois Institute of Technology, or Roosevelt, or the University of Illinois. Even if we could name them, we probably haven't received a call or open an invitation from them to attend an event for Dick Durbin or Mark Kirk. They are not pushing the business leaders to become engaged in the political process or to try to improve funding for the research institutions in the state. The result has been devastating to our capacity to align our resources to garner a larger share of the federal government research pie. <clears throat> we rank something like 45 out of 50 states in terms of what we send to the federal government in taxes and what they send back to our state. In fact, we get about 78 cents back for every dollar we send to the federal government. Protecting the best interests of our state by looking after the University of Illinois is critical to our future and it is how I have spent much of my volunteer time over the last year and a half. In the last 18 months since I was elected chairman of the board of the U University of Illinois, we have been busy and I thought I might be, it might be helpful to give you a, a little bit of an update on our work. First, we came together as a board as individuals from lots of different backgrounds. We acknowledge each other's individuality and unique strengths 
but we are committed to representing not ourselves, but the greater interests of the university. We are melded into a unified force which can speak with a single voice drawn together by a greater purpose. I was one of the first new trustees appointed to the board by Governor Quinn. My nomination was made public five or six days before everyone else's, and just 10 days before our first board meeting, a mere eight days before the agenda needed to be published to meet the guidelines under state law. During those first few days, I met with then President Joe White, and I met with the university's general counsel, Tom Barrows, and I met with the outside counsel, Zach Farden, and then I met with the secretary of the board, Michelle Thompson, and then with President White and the legal team again and again and again, and then with the CFO, Walter Knorr, who many of you know, and we reworked the agenda for the first board meeting. We tried to focus on the important issues facing the university, and we zeroed in on two areas, the comprehensive presentation of the university's finances and organizing a response to the public problems related to the admissions issues that were still looming. When the board meeting began a few days later, our first vote as a newly constituted board was on an agenda item called Special Item 9A. In an historic vote, we abolished the Category I admissions program and returned the university to its strong traditions of integrity and openness in the admissions process. The admissions issues was, of course, uh, the most visible challenge facing the university in September of 2009, but like many great obstacles, it represented just the tip of the iceberg, and there were plenty of other challenges lurking beneath the surface. The admissions issues were, in many ways, not as daunting as were the critical issues related to long-term finance. Many of you here today are from the business community, and after nine years or so of living under Sarbanes-Oxley, you'd be surprised that the University of Illinois, with a $4.5 billion budget at the time, was not operating with a fully functioning audit committee or with a committee charged with overseeing corporate governance that met regularly. The university did have 14 standing committees. It is unclear to me as to whether or not they were designed to provide leadership and vision, or rather to extend the tentacles of certain board members into the day-to-day -day operations of the university. These committees were often made up of the entire board. By constituting the committee in this fashion with full membership, it makes it nearly impossible to create a quorum. Without a quorum, the committee did not need to, repeat, to report their meetings. The committee chairs or co-chairs could meet privately two or three at a time, or perhaps even secretly, and discuss contracts, approve new hires, and speak about allocating university resources without the imposing conditions of public oversight. From a review of previous agendas, it was clear that there were often more items that dealt with awarding the contracts for renovations of some minor room rather than dealing with the more critical issues, like dealing with the response to the competitive threat from private universities luring away our great researchers or leveraging our newfound national political strength in Illinois to attract a greater share of the federal government research pie or developing an overarching vision to attract to the campuses the finest minds from, out, from throughout the country and from around the world. We reorganized the board structure to eliminate those 14 committees and we reduced them down to four, each of which now meets in public session. With a streamlined system in place, we began addressing additional lingering issues as well. Our most important goal was finding a new permanent leader to fill the presidency of the University of Illinois. We realized that a great leader was going to be responsible only if they had the ability to respond. In advance of our search last fall, the board took a number of steps to strengthen the presidency. We've increased the thresholds of contracts that need board approval, thereby increasing the authority of the administration to enter contracts and spend money to keep the trustees out of the day-to-day -day operation and to create greater accountability for the administration. We've increased the president's authority and we've changed the title to president and chief executive to clearly signal our respect for the job. We've clarified reporting relationships where the president reports to the board and everyone else reports to the president. We've strengthened the presidency with additional staff like a head of human resources and an enrollment management executive to ensure that we have the best talent coming into the university. And we've created a position for a new executive to pursue federal research grants as well. As the search for the new president began, we needed to be respectful of the faculty and their desire to be led by a proven educator with strong academic credentials and a record of accomplishment 
in research. We needed a president who could work with the state legislature and with the funding, federal government secu to secure additional federal government research funding. We needed a new chief executive who understood the complexities of an academic medical center and who could combine the public mission of the university with the realities of funding an ongoing capital program necessary to attract great minds from around the country to first class labs. We needed someone who could ignite the fires of imagination among the students and who would be seen as their champion too. We wanted someone who understood the importance of winning athletic teams and who appreciated that in Illinois, we would rather win than lose, but we would rather lose than cheat. We don't wanna cheat on the field and we don't wanna cheat those athletes out of a full and complete education. More importantly, we wanted someone who knew that we could in fact win and educate at the same time. One candidate quickly rose to the top of an incredibly impressive group of peers. Mike Hogan has held nearly every management and executive position in academia, rising steadily through the ranks from professor to dean to executive dean at arts and sciences at Ohio State to provost at Iowa and ultimately to the president of the University of Connecticut. We are delighted that Mike Hogan agreed to join the University of Illinois as its 18th president last July, and in his first eight months, he has done a tremendous job. The critical issues facing the university are not related to admissions or governance, which are fundamentally a distraction, but in fact, our major challenge is around the issue of finance. The government here in our state has a big budget problem. The government is taking in less in taxes than it is paying out in operating costs and pension benefits. The fact that the state of Illinois' budget hole amounts to 47% of our general fund expenditures is a huge challenge, but we don't want our state budget problems to become state economic problems. The damage to the university occurs when the state simply does not pay the University of Illinois what it told us it would, as shown in this chart of outstanding state receivables, showing that the state, is, as of December, owes us $450 million in cash. We don't want to starve the only proven sustainable economic engine that exists, which is a highly functioning academic research institution, which is home to inventors of new ideas and new businesses. At the University of Illinois, we have a long-term issue related to a steady decline in state support for the university. In the last year, eight years, since 2002, we've lost over $100 million in annual revenue from the state. At the same time, inflation has continued its relentless force, devastating our purchasing power. The university has continued to expand and to grow to fulfill our land-grant mission, adding new students every year, all of which demand greater resources. If you take all of these factors together at once, the decline in state support, the ravishing effects of inflation, and the increase in the number of students, you get a number where, on an inflation-adjusted basis, state support per student has declined 37% in the last 10 years. In 1970, the state matched $12 in subsidy for every dollar a student paid in tuition. Today, the state provides 80 cents for every dollar in tuition. All of this occurred at a time when the state was in terrible financial straits, and it was only natural for the government to look at cutting our funding, particularly when the scandals broke out. I think any responsible state official needed to be cautious about giving additional revenue to an organization whose corporate governance was in disarray and whose use of public funds has been called into question. I think the fact that the board moved quickly and dealt with the admissions issues, made progress on the governance questions, responded to the MICVA commission recommendations, strengthened the presidency, reinstated great leadership, and restored a solid financial foundation, allowed the governor and other elected officials to see the progress that we have made and to rally with us. In terms of the next steps we need to take over the next few months to continue our progress, the first is to restaff the upper echelons of the university. The university has 16 of its top administrative positions, currently staffed by administrators serving on an interim basis. We need to fill each of these positions with permanent leaders of top flight quality, just like we did with Mike Hogan and Lisa Troyer and Cappy Lang and Joe Garcia. We need to continue to strengthen our lobbying effort. 
Last year, we recruited our Director of Government Affairs, Cappy Lang, and brought in new directors to support her effort, including Deshauna Forney. We teamed with the Alumni Association, which has 300,000 living alumni in Illinois, which created Illinois Connections, and when it's fully functioning, it should become the most potent lobbying force in our state. We are in the process of recruiting a leader for our new Washington office who will assist the federal government efforts, and we hope to have the office open and staffed by the end of the first quarter of this year. We've modified an existing position as the vice president of research for the entire university who will assist the campus leaders with their efforts to attract additional funding from the federal agencies like the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. With these changes made, we can now focus on our future. Hopefully, we will have at least six years to make hay while the sun shines on Illinois. We are in a very special time because we have representatives of Illinois serving as the President of the United States, his Chief of Staff, the second most powerful United States Senator in Dick Durbin, and one of the most powerful Congresswomen in Jan Schakowsky. We have an incredibly strong congressional delegation representing each University of Illinois campus, including Danny Davis in Chicago, Tim Johnston in Urbana-Champaign, Don Mazzullo representing Rockford, and Aaron Schock rec representing Springfield and Peoria. And of course, the executive branch is staffed with the sons and daughters of Illinois, including Ray LaHood, the Secretary of Transportation. Hopefully, we can work with their teams to improve the economic viability of our region by increasing our research funding at the university. In my mind, our response to the challenges we face started with a single issue, which is a commitment to be the best at what we do. I think if students think we are the best at what we do, more will want to be accepted to the university, so more of them will apply. If a university diploma is a symbol of being associated with the best university of its kind, then it will become a bargaining chip for higher wages and greater corporate advancement. If the University of Illinois is the best of its kind, it will receive a greater share of state funding, and our leaders in Washington will fight their colleagues for a greater share of the pie. The university will thrive, and it will ultimately serve the best interest of the state and its people. There are many routes through higher education, and all of them are valid, from trade schools to certificate programs to community colleges to four-year programs. There are lots of reasons why government should support higher education, and many of them are routinely cited by politicians and advocates in the field. Colleges, as a general case, are important because they can prepare workers for jobs in new industries. The college experience improves the chances for personal fulfillment and creates a higher quality of life for people whose degrees ultimately provide higher financial attainment. There is something special about academic research institutions, however, and they, and they therefore have a special mantle of leadership and a certain burden to help all other forms of higher education. We don't want people who are taught the joys of education at a community college and want to continue their lifelong learning to be forced to move out of state to a place like Florida when they retire. We don't want the skilled workers who earn a certificate in medical technology and construction management at a trade school to have to move to New York or California to find a job. We don't want our highly skilled graduates ready to be the knowledge workers of the future forced to pursue their careers only with companies headquartered in London, Chicago, or, or Charlotte, or New York. Our state's research institutions have a special role in creating not just jobs and companies, but the potential to spawn entire industries which can contribute to the economic rebirth of our state and our region. We must all work together. San Jose thrives not just because of Stanford, but because of cooperation between research performed at Stanford and Berkeley, which is fostered by the entire intellectual environment created and enhanced by the dozens of universities in the area. The same is true about Harvard and MIT, which could never thrive as they do if they were not part of the cluster of universities in Boston. The same goes for Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh. We are so well poised in Chicago with City Colleges and Columbia, DePaul, IIT, Loyola, Northwestern, Roosevelt, UIC, and the University of Chicago. We have the largest population of college kids in any city in America, in Chicago, and now, by working together, we can have the best outcomes of any state in the nation. We are the biggest, let's be the best. Being the best at what we do has become our number one job, and we cannot obtain it with cheap wages or with false honor. It needs to be rooted in being the best in the country, the best in the nation in every aspect of our building being. The fact that we're building the world's fastest computer in Urbana, the Blue Waters Project supported by the National F Science Foundation, 
IBM and the National Center on Supercomputing Applications is testament to the fact that we can continue to lead the world. More than anything else, we want to retain in Illinois the minds of young researchers and brilliant students. These are our collective children, and we want to keep them close to home. These are the young people who we want to recruit to our offices. These are the young people who we want leading our companies in the future. These are the ones who will reinvent our society over and over again with new ideas that create new companies, which hire new employees, who pay taxes, which support schools, which educate a whole new generation ready to begin that cycle again. Public academic research institutions are the greatest renewable resource that this country has ever had. Let's protect the one that we have in Illinois. We can beat back the forces of consolidation. We can engage in economic development. We can create jobs, and we can protect the future of our state. I hope I can count on you and your support as we strengthen the University of Illinois. I speak for the entire board when I say we intend to earn that support. We intend to earn your respect. We intend to preserve the pride that everyone should have in the state's flagship university and in some small but important way, we hope that this will restore the pride which we should all have in the state of Illinois. Thank you all very much. Uh, watch this line, are you ready? Perhaps the luckiest guy in Illinois right now is a guy named Quinn that this speech wasn't given a year ago. Uh, <laughs> the fact that I met this young fellow, I worked for his dad in Indiana, had nothing to do with that at all. All right, if you have any questions, and I too was at that first little any festivities at uh, Soldier Field. Uh, let's get to questions. Please, uh, oh. Oh, you, you just yourself. This is not a question. This is, go ahead. Oh, I, I'm, I'm asked to acknowledge my younger sister, Rory Kennedy. <laughs> Yeah. There's so many. So Chris is there too. Give away Chris. Okay. A lot of, uh, well, you had a whole bunch, you know. Yeah, you're tough. All right, we have, uh, I know this is not easy, so here we go. We got Mark Blumenthal, a member of the City Club, how, uh, who's got two degrees from the UIC. How do we translate the reforms of the U of I to the city of Chicago? <laughs> the man's an educator, but uh, you don't want to. Nah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't. Any other questions? I doubt it. After that, cowards die many times before their death. The valiant taste death but once. Uh, uh, yell it out. There was a guy named Emmanuel. Go ahead, Chris, get the microphone. There were a, a whole range of people from the city in that, in that presentation. I, I think it would be helpful to um, identify Skip Garcia, who, um, will you stand up, Skip? Skip now runs all the research endeavors at the University of Chicago and at, at UIC, and he's been incredibly thoughtful about how the city can be supportive of uh, the campus there. The city, in fact, is super supportive now, but <clears throat> whoever's the mayor of the city of Chicago can impact the outcomes in uh, half a dozen congressional elections. There's not a major elected official who doesn't come to Chicago to raise money, and the United States senators are all very dependent on what happens with Chicago, and that means that the mayor of the city of Chicago is in a place to greatly affect the activities and efforts by the congressional delegation, and we hope to work with the city to make sure that that congressional delegation is 
totally focused on bringing back to the University of Illinois on all of its campuses greater research dollars. This will be the last question from a soon-to-be former board member of the uh, City Club of Chicago, Mr. Ed Mazur, who also is a graduate of the University of Illinois, has two degrees from the University of Illinois, as opposed to me, only has one. Here we go. This is from Ed Mazur. I've known him, but I don't know him after I answer, uh, read this question. Christ Christopher, given the financial problems faced by the U of I, how do you, I assume he means the board, justify giving the football coach a $250,000 increase for fielding such a mediocre team? <laughs> By the way, you know, Ed, those degrees can be uh, rescinded. I'd say that, that's like a great question. It, it's a terrific question for the, for, for the board. <clears throat> and I think it's a little bit of a layup in that that I've given a lot of thought. And the truth is that the coach reports to the athletic director. The athletic director reports to the chancellor on the Urbana campus. The chancellor on the Urbana campus reports to the president of the University of Illinois, who reports to us. In no organization in the United States, no highly functioning organization, would the board of directors get involved with a negotiation five levels down in the organization, and we're not going to do that now at the University of Illinois. <laughs> Absolutely no political uh, acumen in that answer at all. Yes. <laughs> Identify yourself. Say, Sam was one of the first people I met with, and um, his uh, great moral compass was incredibly helpful to me as I was figuring out um, what we needed to do at the university. And his role um, has, has never diminished there. In fact, he played a critical uh, role later on when we were recruiting Mike Hogan, and he'd come and he met the entire board, and we realized we had no gift for him. And, and Sam took off Sam's tie and gave it to Mike Hogan, and that sealed the deal. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Okay.